I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Truth? What does that even mean when my truth is something some people refuse to believe? My truth is irrelevant, exaggerated, naive. Today, I will testify not to the judge or jury, but I testify to justice, Lady Justice. The blindfold is a testament of your integrity, the balancing scales of your responsibility. Justice, I've been told to forget. Forget about the suffering, sacrifices, and martyrdom of my ancestors. Forget about many of our nation's greatest investors. Justice, I choose not to forget, but remember. Remember in the same way we remember our American soldiers. Remember the same courage and audacity to demand freedom. Remember we are still here and they are the reason. Justice, I testify of what I know, but then again, what do I know? Let's see, I know courtesy of the premeditated media, the who, what, when, where, and oh yes, let's not forget the why. The most unbearably political of them all. Justice, remove your blindfold for just a second. Look me in the eye, then tell me that what I know about you is not a fabricated lie. Tell me the truth in the stories of Martin and Brown. Turn around, turn around and look at me. Remind them that I'm supposed to be free because at this point, like Gardner, I can't breathe. Justice, get the heavy weight of their justifications off of me because in the, my mind, this is not supposed to be. We've come too far. This is not the time for you to leave. Pick up your sword, this war is not yet won. Cause as sure as the sun rises above the mountain, we must overcome, justice overcome. Overcome the pressure to turn away from me. Overcome the urge of some to pretend like they cannot see. Overcome, because I'm tired of meaningless justifications. Because all I can see are the troubles that would only be found in a divided nation. Still having to plead into high class places where I don't belong. While in the back of my mind, kings echoes of how long? Not long. Justice, did I come to the wrong place? In which some people can't realize that through it all I've been gifted my race? Gifted the ability to endure a gift given by his love that is nothing but pure. His love who reaffirms that I matter. We matter. His love makes him bound not only to justice but mercy. Not justice but mercy. Mercy for them. Mercy for me. Mercy for all. So on that day when I look up at him sitting at that mercy seat. Till that day I swear. I solemnly swear to never forget to tell my truth, the whole truth, and nothing but his truth. So help me God. That was beautiful. That was Navi. Uh, it was called Justice, Just and Justice and Truth and Mercy. Um, I want to first uh, welcome everyone to our second annual Justice Poetry Jam, Words Are Movements. My name is Eric Arguello, I'm the Advocacy Manager for GLIDE under the Center for Social Justice. But before we begin, I want to introduce our project coordinator for CSJ, Hannah Van Alstine, who will read our land acknowledgement. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As indigenous stewards of this land, and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homelands. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, today, we're honored to have a great panel of powerful and prominent community poets 
who will share some of their poetic words with us and share their insights, inspirations, and how poetry and words inspire movements. I will introduce each panelist and they will share some of their work. We will then ask our panelists a series of questions and if the audience has any questions, please include them in the chat and we will, go, uh, and we will get to uh, three of them in the end if we have enough time. Uh, with that, our first panelist is Nisha DeLovely, uh, Oakland, California native. Nisha DeLovely is an acclaimed poet and spirited community servant who found her purpose in radical verse. She fiercely affects her audiences by disrupting the silence of taboo subjects, unapologetically flowing through narrative, dramatic, and lyrical poetry. Her portfolio includes creating lit array therapy workshops, hosting healing retreats, beautification projects, altar designs, living and textile artistry, theater, and her greatest passion, community service. She creates provocative, survivor-based performances and community events for awareness and resolution under the production name Nisha De Lovely Presents. As a conqueror of selective butism, a severe anxiety disorder characterized by the inability to speak in certain social settings resulting from childhood trauma, Nisha uh, uses her reclaimed voice instrumentally to help empower others. In 2021, Nisha founded The Lovely Nest, a poetry creativity parlor located in gentrification, shaking downtown Oakland, that fosters self-esteem and humanity through art artistry and charity in a safe environment. Welcome, Nisha. Peace and love, thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm blessed to see you all, I hope everyone's well. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Shall I begin? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, I'll begin with um, a poem that really asks the question, Black girl, why do you speak? Black woman, why do you speak? Why do you speak so loud? Why do you speak so much? Why do you speak? Survivor, hush. Tired of hearing your cries. Victimize, always the victim. Can it be lies? Can it be lies? Always the victim. Black girl, black woman, so loud, so proud. Calm down, adjust your crown. Sometimes we want to hear nothing, silence your hush why do you cry all the time why is your might so great why do you fight for sake please please just hush and be great for me with love the patriarch and so why do i speak I'll tell you why I speak. I speak for the native man who owns this land and river spirits of the reservation. I speak for the cotton crowns, the soulful roots and strange fruits of the plantation. I speak for the transcontinental folks and railroad ghosts denied naturalization. I speak for the modern farmers, the golden guardians and those seeking immigration. I speak for the crying rainbows of the LGBT communities braving discrimination. I speak for the child who's lost his or her voice to molestation, fearful of having that conversation. I speak for everyone, everyone of this nation feeling lowered in deflation. That's why I cry, pray, verbally slay. That's why I speak so proudly. I speak for us. I was asked, or the question is asked, what's our favorite poem? And I have a couple of pieces that I wouldn't necessarily call my favorite. But as a survivor who fights for children, right, and fights the system against sexual deviance and rape culture and child molestation and sex trafficking, I feel obligated, compelled to always, always include poetry that fights, that provokes, 
that radically stomps as it brings awareness of child molestation and child sex trafficking. Why do I speak? I speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, for those who have been ignored. I speak for those who have been silenced and those who experience selective mutism. And for them, I say, who's marching for me? Who's marching for me when the forecasted hell has nothing to do on my unforeseen internal storm? Ain't no paint, no canopy or umbrella prevent the torrential weather which I endure. Most folks retreat to home for security, but what if the refuge you seek only shelters the freak who silently violates you without an ounce of accountability? Apology, a penalty. How? Do I avoid these clouds, this rain, this blizzard, that hurricane that impedes my need for safety? What have I done to live in such misery? I fold at the thought of the cold, but what option have I when my domestic situation includes child molestation? So it's either lie with the knife or die by the knife. A child, a child praying hopelessly for a better life. Nowadays, everybody's watching and waiting on a story for something to say, but mention pedophilia, the crowd gets silent and looks the other way. Folks are out here protesting over everything every day. I see them marching, I hear them screaming. Well, I'm screaming for help and running from demons. Are you ignoring this or just oblivious? I understand that certain subjects are still considered taboo, but look, I need you to march for me too. So who's marching for me? Wow, powerful words. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have our next panelist, Charita Mikkel. Miss T, also known as Mama T. <laughs> Charita Mikkel, author and story medicine woman, is an award-winning poet recently named MOAD's 2022 Poet in Residence. She's an activist for holism, Qigong healer, workshop leader, storyteller, lyricist, and a Bay Area writer, project teacher, consultant, who has published 73 California poets in the school's at-risk student anthologies since 1989. Her full-length collection, Synchronicity, Synchron Synchron sorry, The Oracle of Sun Medicine, was released in February 2020 and was nominated for the California Book Award. She also uh, co-curated the practice Lumumba anthology with East Side Arts Alliance released in January 2021, both published by Nomadic. Welcome, Charita. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. And thank you, Nasia, uh, Nisha. Uh, wow, there's uh, much, I think we, we find ourselves involved in activism in some way because of uh, what we've gone through. I'm going to, um, Read this piece. Uh, I'll unmute myself. Am I muted? Uh, no, we can hear you. You're fine. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of why okay. this little thing is here. Unmute myself. We, we can <laughs> hear you. We can see it's you. It's deciding but we can hear you. for me that I am muted when I am not. But technology has been strange. <laughs> anyway. Um, this is, uh, I, I find that there are poems that go through uh, a number of things mentioning issues that, that are disturbing to me. So uh, this one is called Her Sermon, Her Sermon on the Mount. Why say he, 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 he good, 
He good. He good all the time, all the time, all the time. God, he, he good. He watches over us. He takes care of us. When he watched over them, take my baby, rape my baby, hang my baby, shoot my baby, lynch, butcher and burn my baby, drown my baby, castrate my baby, lobotomize my baby, jail my baby, traffic my baby, imprison my baby, enslave my baby, take home, land, culture away from my babies because God is good good he works in mysterious ways oh yes he does his ways are so mysterious God he 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 good he good he good all the time all the time all the time he's good all the damn time he watched them commit genocide on us kidnap kidnap our babies traffic our babies make them pray then pray on our babies prostitute our babies rape our babies hang our babies send our babies to war miseducating our babies deplore our babies into schizophrenic misfits turn our babies into killers, our babies shooting our babies, offering them as sacrifice for our sins, sending them to a better place because we born broken, don't you know? Yes, God, he, 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 he good, he good, he, 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 he good all the time, all the time, all the time. My country tis of the, the, the sweet land of, of, of one nation under God with liberty and totalitarian justice. He, he, good, good, so, shh, to, quiet child, that God switched habitat for humanity off long ago. He demands insanity, runs his warship, cut stars from sky, gave Ankh a hysterectomy, now it's a cross we bear. Death commands we rely on his word. A will be done kills daughters and sons because God is no respecter of persons. Not into women, earth, or children. Water, womb, blood, baptism. Sun, moon, seasons, reasons to seed, cook. Just right. Woman, mathematics, unholy. Her knowledge, a sin in this garden. Only he can be righteous. Are you listening, child? Your prayer ends with amen. A group of men casting monotheistic charms, absolving one another from fault without end. It is coming to a close. Know this. Dog is man's best friend not woman. Greeks convert ISIS to serious. Don't you see? The anadrome for dog is God. Whether coming or going, this spell tells you well to sit, heal, fetch, obey, and stay down, bitch. And wonder not why you're treated worse than or can't think beyond his dependency. Ask what is blasphemy? What is sacrilege? What does that look like? How does it behave? What is its purpose? Who pronounced judgment? What epistemic rims support the gate of this castle? Which membrane allows certain things in and certain things out for its good? Who will it serve? Really? He? He? He good. Good. All the... What? And that's one piece. 
Wow. I love that. I Amazing. Love that. Yes. Powerful words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mama Sweeter. Yes. <laughs> and our third panelist is here. Uh, and I just want to say, too, that, you know, these description that I have for these panelists is just a little bit about the work that they've done, but there's so much more. So what we're, we're um, reading about them is just, you know, very brief. I just wanted to, to put that out there. Uh, our next poet is Lisa, Lisa Gray Garcia. And I know you're there. Um, also known as Tina, is a formerly unhoused, un, uh, incarcerated poverty scholar, revolutionary journalist, lecturer, poet, visionary, teacher, and single mama of Tuberxio, daughter of a houseless indigenous disabled Mama D, and the co-founder of Poor Magazine. She has authored over 200 stories and blogs on poverty, racism, incarceration, and displacement. With her Mama D, she co-founded Escuela de la Gente, People School, a poor and indigenous people-led school, as well as several cultural projects such as the Po Poets Project, Poetas Pobres y Proyecto, Welfare Queens, The Theater of the Poor, Teatro de los Pobres, Hotel Voices, and Poverty Schools, to name a few. She's also the author of Criminal of Poverty, Growing Up Homeless in America, co-editor of The Colonizer's Guide to a Humble Revolution, Born and raised in Frisco, and her second book, Poverty Scholarship, Poor People, Theory, Arts, Words, and Tears Across Mama Earth, a poet's text. So, Lisa? Hey, what's up? I go by Tiny Fam, but that's okay. Uh, my mama <laughs> called me Lisa, and I think she's with us today with the beautiful palabra that came from Nisia and Tarita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Those were... Thank you Tina. Yeah, it, it's Tiny. Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tell you that that's my porn star name, but I will. That's where, hey. Well, welcome. Uh, but thank you. No, no. And thank you for this beautiful invitation. Um, there's so much medicine from the cistern that are um, on here and the brethren. Thank you. Um, you see that houseless mom and daughter sleeping in a tent? I said, did you see that houseless mom and daughter sleeping in a tent? That's because we can't afford the rent. Evicted, swept, and kicked. Evicted, swept, and kicked. That's because settler towns like this don't give a shit. Our houseless bodies are merely worth the price of the bottles and cans can get. Yeah, I'm a poverty scholar. That houseless mama, that houseless daughter, all those people you don't want to see never want to be look away from me what you going to do arrest me we're in your city yeah i'm a poverty scholar and i rock my jailhouse attire not because orange is the new black believe that hollywood crack it's because me and my poor mama did jail time for the poverty crime of being houseless in this occupied indigenous holler yeah, I'm a poverty scholar, the melanin challenge daughter of a strong Afro-Boricua mama, for without whom there would be no me, a mama soltera and a welfare queen. So I just want to send an extra prayer to all of our brothers and sisters who aren't here, all of my fellow brothers and sisters who literally have been killed by the colonial lies of poverty, scarcity, and homelessness. There was always pleasant, plenty for us here, and there still is. But we are lost in the cult of hoarding and the cult of independence. And so I appreciate this beautiful space with all this palabra. And I have a couple um, pieces, and I'm torn about which one to read because I'm among all these 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 beautiful sisters with right, this work um, is blowing me away. But I'll just read a couple short ones. My tired eyes rest, I take a sky breath, from sheriff boots and loss of roots, from scattered paper because evictions are later. Sky breath, 
means a moment to rest from my latest arrest, from the scam lord's breath, from what my hustle and my pimp expects, from this hotel bed writhing with small red pests. The world has lied to me. There is no abundance inside of me. Will I get a break? Will there ever be a moment away? Will I get a day that isn't filled with what I gotta take or die because of how high the stakes? Sky breath. Does the peacefulness include my death or just another exhausting day of hustle and pain and hope of a better way? I fly into that sky, unhomeless, dreaming I'm out of this motelness, this backseat of car mess, this park bench, my own unshowered stench, something less stressed, home full instead of homeless. So I do wanna let folks know that us uh, poor and houseless people are building a homeless people's solution to homelessness, a uh, self-determined movement out here in Deep East Duchin, that's Oakland. And um, we urge folks to come check us out, but um, us poor people have our solutions, believe it or not. It's just people don't listen. So I'm gonna read one last piece as I heard uh, Eric's beautiful question about favorite poem. And that was a hard one for me too. I think I write trauma so that it doesn't stick to the heart of this mama. Um, and so that I can, I can live. And I'm sure you all can relate. This is called the privilege of breathing. As you sit under your roofs and complain about the soot, watching air quality index soar to the roof, I must remind all of you living in places so you can shelter in safety of so many of us still outside. Evicted behind the lie of rent, the myth of success, the hoarding of stolen mama earth and all those real estate snake papers and payments, hiding in doorways, car seats, bus benches without a place away from your sheltered eyes while mama earth rages outside and you close your windows and doors, heeding the warnings of sheltering in place for sure. While so many of us can barely breathe, no longer having the privilege of sheltered safe space in the colonial terror launched centuries ago, poor people made poor by theft and the lie of ownership continue to slip in and out of your fake lie called non-profiteering and business improvement districts, the privilege of breathing. Shelter beds and vouchers, saviors and charity complex, black and brown police terror leading up black and brown police murder. And then there is the lie of rent. And once again, we are all left to ask, how do you shelter in place when you have no place? How do you housed peoples and politricksters continue to practice the violent act of looking away? Now, I don't want your pity. I don't want your crumbs. I want to close a door, shut a window and share the privilege of breathing one more day to come. Oh, Mateo, I say, thank you, family. Amazing, the amazing words, Tiny. Thanks so much for being here. We have some very special people with us here. That is some great talent we just heard. Um, and we're gonna get a little bit deeper uh, with our panelists. Um, we're gonna go through our questions. We have about six or seven questions that we're go gonna go through. Um, if we can get our panelists up on the screen. Tarita, Nisha. Yes, uh, here and, I am. Tiny, tiny. I just want to make sure I got it right. <laughs> I, have, I have to say it. Thank you. <laughs> Earlier, I, I was making sure that I would pronounce everybody's name. <laughs> right, right, right. It's all good. It's all good. Great. All love. So, so I, I, do, I do believe that anybody who calls me Lisa even by accident, is channeling my mama. So that's, oh, that's, that's a nice. lesson. Thank that's you. That's nice. Thank Good you. to hear. So let's begin the questions. You know, something very basic, you know. Uh, what got you started writing poetry? What, what moved you? 
we'll start with uh, Charita. Oh, wow. <laughs> what, what moved you to, to start writing? Okay, that's, that's, I'll, I'll just give you a snippet sure. <laughs> because there's, there's so much, but um, I, I, um, I grew up uh, here in California in an area where, as I said, my father named me and he was really part of the soil, my mother and my father, they, what he grew, she canned and, and did all of that. I had this this childhood that was really mixed with some fascinating quality of things. Um, so there was life, light, nature, birds, and grandpa telling me about a lynching he witnessed uh, when I was about seven or eight years old and he felt he needed to tell me that being a mulatto. And um, then uh, that means, you know, he was so light skinned that he was able to witness what had taken place with this black man. And then you would find men like that would run and tell those who were darker and this was in Louisiana. So, um, and then, uh, you know, 10 years old, my mother dies and I see her spirit walk, but I didn't know it was her spirit walking. I thought it was, um, I thought she had come home from the hospital, but um, she was crossing over and she kissed my forehead. Um, and that was the last I, I saw. Her. And, and uh, you know, she went to church. We went to church all the time. She, she uh, um, embroidered the Lord's prayer in about, I guess it was 35, 40 point uh, uh, font you know, just Lord's Prayer, the entire Lord's Prayer hung over my bed um, in this rainbow colored thread for, you know, for a few years uh, before she passed. Um, and then, um, you know, I learned about spirits uh, and then I, we had to go into foster care because my father was haunted by my mother. So I realized that I wasn't the only one seeing her. She was, you know, also affecting him and when we moved from that house, it burned down four times. Um, and then, uh, you know, so we went into foster care and then there was, you know, the rape, the beatings, the obesity, um, I contract Bell palsy, half my face is dead, paralyzed, attempt suicide, um, experience a second vision of those worse off than me, so I stopped my attempt um, and then three years after foster care, I see foster niece of the foster uncle who tried to rape me and she tells me he died of a heart attack in church, which I found myself uh, bursting into laughter without warning and then it scares me because I didn't know my body could hold something like that and just act on it with such, because I know how hurt I was and what I was going through when he was attempting that. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's just the basic, you know, things uh, of why and what, you know, uh, got me to write poetry. Just, wow. and, and there's a questions to all those things, of course. Sure, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. That was very uh, special. Um, Nisha. Um. First, I just wanted to digest everything that you just said, Mama yeah. Tarita. That was intense and powerful and, and beautiful. And thank you. Thank you for sharing thank so you. much of yourself. Um, and to well, we're all, we're all here to heal. We're this is about a healing that. thing, you know. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, yes. You're welcome. Um, so I have always been a lover of literature um, and as far back as I can remember and when I forget um, my relatives remind me especially my mom she'll remind me when I was like three and four um, I would pick up the magazines the Jet and Ebony magazines and just kind of kind of recreate my own magazine in so many words and I would write stories and create Hallmark cards every morning that my mom went to work 
it was just the saddest thing ever for me. So I would lay cards around and they would have little poems and um, she was a praying woman or she is a praying woman, although she she is woman, she is human. So there was error in everything. You know, we're always learning, making up for what we, we mistakenly done in the past. But what she did right was she taught, she taught me prayer. And so um, it was just, it was just a passion of mine. Words, words stood out to me. Um, but that's the good side. When I was a child writing poetry and just thought the world was butterflies and cotton candy, and then trauma mm. hit. Mm. And so I'm very transparent. And so I'll, I'll just share this briefly because I, I, I shared a lot. I'm a survivor of child molestation. Child molestation is an ugly umbrella that encompasses a lot of things from vulgar speech to rape. And so um, as a survivor of um, what's called domestic servitude, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, sex slavery, mm. um, things turn bad in the home, really bad um, around the age of 10. And so I went from writing these beautiful cards and stories and fables, you know, for my family and for my friends to entertain them to now writing for my life. So I turned to journaling and within my journal, it wasn't just stories about what I was going through. It was about what I wish, what I wanted, what I needed. It was prayers. And so I would then lay those around the house. And because there was so much abuse going on, that was a short story, so much abuse going on, I lost my voice. So by the age of 13, um, I couldn't hold my head up. I couldn't, I couldn't express myself. It, articulating myself was impossible. I wanted to be a normal child and, and talk and laugh, but I couldn't. So poetry became my form of communication and, and writing prayers and, and short stories to uplift myself, knowing there was something greater than me and greater mm -hmm. than the bad, just staying very hopeful. And one day I decided I would like to share. One day, I think I was in the 10th grade, I shared a piece. I was asked to share um, just a story, I guess, to talk to a group of peers because they were they were unruly in the Oakland Unified mm -hmm. School District. If you talk a lot, you're unruly. They didn't understand. I didn't talk because I couldn't. And so I, I struggled through it, but I shared a poem. And when I realized the effect that that piece had on my peers and my counselors and my teachers. Um, it gave me the push and the purpose. And now I call my poetry a ministry, helping those ah. who don't have voice find their voice. Nice. Beautiful. It's amazing how spirituality and healing, you know, have evolved your works. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's amazing to hear. Mm -hmm. So tiny. Hey, family. Thank you, Nisia, for that. Um, welcome. And to Rita for all of your beautiful words. Um, yeah, and Eric for holding the space. Uh, you know, it's it, just hearing you, Nisia. I mean, I'm a survivor, too, and I, I don't talk about that as much because I, I some, and it, it's, it's funny. It's so beautiful that we get to be in this space and talk about art and trauma all at the same time, right? Because we know they're interlinked. Um, and really, uh, right, art. For, I think uh, I speak for myself on this, but I'm assuming all of us feel this way. Art is 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 literally kept me alive, mm -hmm. um, right? And when I hear about the stories of both of the these beautiful sisters, I also remind me that you know that I don't, I did not write about surviving the multitude of um, child abuse and child uh, specifically uh, incest and. I still have that work to do. How about that? Um, but I got stuck, if you will, on, you know, mama had barely made it out alive that she could raise me. Um, you know, some of what Tarita was saying, I'm imagining is similar to her. She was in foster homes that, and, and orphanages. And she said they called, she renamed them torture homes, mm -hmm. um, right? She said, abuse doesn't cut it. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Um, they, they literally wanted to kill her. And um, 
like oh, straight boy. up, right? Straight up. Um, <laughs> she was a mixed race child in, uh, in a big white world of hate. Mm. And also in, I also, so one of the things that I always teach uh, to young people as well as, as elders, but she was an unprotected child, which is arguably one of the most dangerous things any of us can be, right? Nobody watching after her, nobody. Um, and, and that's absolutely terrifying just to sit with that. Um, and we know that it happens to our babies all over all the time. Um, but it's also the work that I do too. you know, I literally care for children and elders and folks just because I'm always terrorized by, and I carry my mama's trauma with me and because of her trauma, of course, then we went through it together. So she barely made it out alive, survived to raise me as a single parent um, by any means necessary, the way us mamas do, the way our mamas do, uh, with all that. And, um, you know, got with my colonizer dad because she had been taught whiteness was rightness. And, you know, here I am, right, walking through the world. Um, and I say all that to say it right when I was 11. Uh, she did lose. She couldn't keep on keeping on. She said, one more little murder of the soul. Yes, I'm done. And she became disabled and we were on the street and remained that way for years. And we were hiding out in doorways and bus shelters and park benches and shelter beds. And if we were lucky, put two nickels together, got a motel, sometimes squatted at an apartment by telling all kinds of stories that my, my white looking self could tell scam lords and they would believe it because racism is alive and well in America land, we already know, right? Um, but anyway, so in that moment when, when everything fell apart, writing is all I had, right? It's all I had for sanity, for survival, and for like some kind of life preserver that a rope was attached to, you know? And I think I just wrote for my life and I would have to do it in secret half the time because we were always hustling or hiding, you know, as a poor family, you can't be seen. CPS will separate, that's all there is to it. The minute you outside seen as houseless, you're done. And um, yeah, so um, I think I started at 11, most definitely. I had to drop out of formal institutions of learning, as I often say, and enroll full time in the School of Hard Knocks, which I'm proud to say I graduated with a PhD in poverty <laughs> and not from an institution named after eugenesis, but from the streets. Um, but anyway, all that to say, uh, Mama was also my teacher. Yeah. Eva Yema, thank you. Thank you for taking writing that seriously and for making sure that your daughter even could pick up that pen, no matter what. Oh, Mateo. Thank you so much, Tiny. Thank you for sharing your stories. It, yeah. They're powerful. You yeah. know, it, it, it tells us how words can heal. We're happy to have you guys here sharing. So we're, we're honored, and I think we're, we're blessed to have you here. Um, our second question, uh, who was your inspiration? What individual do you feel, you know, gave you that little extra push to do what you do? Um, Tarita? Okay, I'll go again. <laughs> um, I had uh, just sent um, a little note to uh, Nisha and thanks, thanks Tiny. I had heard you uh, speak of that story before in the past on uh, KPFA. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's, it's, we all have our ways of attacking what it is we're confronted with. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's uh, been a, a journey, uh, let's see. Let me, before I start going here, what was my inspiration? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so thanks again. Um, yes, questioning, questioning, questioning why, because I, I, I started writing because there was no one to talk to. Mm -hmm. There was no one around to talk to when you are in a, in a foster home and you're already, I mean, you can imagine what a 205 pound black child with half her face dead and mm. profuse acne looking like, you know, pizza face, uh, you know, just, 
you know, who wants to talk to you? <laughs> so, anyway, but I, I noticed all these other things and, you know, the spirit walking and, you know, um, voices, things that my mother allowed me to experience uh, that she would allow me to talk to her about because I would have these experiences. So I just, I wrote because, you know, there was, you know, the, just, just things in nature that, that mm -hmm. was my inspiration of the, and then later historical accounts and why, why things are going on as they are going on. And um, then um, graduating from a, a seminary school, I looked at things on another level and uh and questioned more uh and then having been a nurse um and then pre-med i mean you just getting into looking at more and more how and why things are as they are so it was just a lot of questioning mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of questioning and then uh people ask you know and very few ask well how did you come out of that because people look at me today and don't realize what I've come out of. And that was, you know, I, I've, I've witnessed uh, many things I and I believe it's because it is the reason why I have taught so many children, you know, 73 anthologies of, of children's uh, work. And these aren't children singular, but these are classrooms, some schools you know, uh, children's voices need to be heard. You know, it's always, you know, uh, children need to be seen, but not heard. But this this fight to get children heard is is something. And it's and it's always, you know, a low uh, disrespect that I constantly see um today uh because people don't pay attention to what they say around babies or children so that's as part of the mm -hmm. the inspiration is just life basically i should say before i just go on and on yes i understand thank you for that uh nisha you know what was your inspiration not necessarily a person you know it could be anything like charita was talking about you know what really gave you that push um I needed to express myself. Um, yes, I, I needed, I, it was a need. The push was a need, a need for expression, a need to get it out. Um, I can't spend the rest of my life crying. That was certain. Yes. Um, and even with the tears, even with the tears, it, it, there was um, always a sense of being invisible. And, and Mama Tarita just really spoke on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from that home where they taught you're to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. And oh, what an mm -hmm. error. What a mistake. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> what a mistake. And so I, I needed to express myself so badly that, and I often say this, um, people will sometimes drift off they'll lose interest. And a lot of times they'll let you know if they don't say it with their mouth, their face certainly mm. will tell you, shut up, we've had enough. Mm. But when you put that pen to paper, that's it. There's no judgment, mm -hmm. there's no criticism. And so I, I needed to express myself and I needed to know that it was okay. Everything that I was going through and feeling, it was it was legit. So I gave myself permission to feel uh, mm -hmm. through writing. So that that was my push. And then again, when I shared the piece, um, it's, it's, it's entitled My Youth. It was actually my story. And um, again, the adults, it was it was the reaction of my my counselors and the teachers who actually had chosen me to speak to the, the rowdy children, right? Um, it was their reactions. You know, one asked me, why did you write that? <laughs> What's, literally asked me, why did you write that? And whose story is it? And I said, it's my story. Mm -hmm. And she, she said, thank you. Wow. Because yeah. it was also her story. Mm -hmm. 
And that was so powerful and so purposeful that that really opened me to, to purpose. So I saw myself as this this dead, this this wasted space. And now all of a sudden I feel not that there's anything good with being a sacrifice. Cause I, for a very long time, I felt like, why did I have to go through this so that I can teach a lesson or help the next person? <laughs> but it, it gave me purpose. So I, I was inspired to write, to write, to write, because that's what prompted my voice. It, it gave me a reason. It gave me permission to feel it was okay. And Got here it. I am today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. And Tiny? Yeah, um, I keep going through different things for hearing hearing you guys talk. Um, again, I think that it it was a lifeline, literally survival. But going back to inspiration, you know, it, it was. I mean, life is is inspiration, right? Survival, struggle. Mm -hmm. um, Luis Rodriguez, our art is our struggle. Our struggles are life, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when I really remembered the, one of the most important things that happened is when we were originally evicted. I'll never forget that. The, um, and I, it's one of the ways that I open, it's how I open the page of criminal poverty and I'll never forget it. Um, because I had to lock myself in a closet and just cry for eight hours. Mm -hmm. Um, losing everything, uh, that, you know, as a kid, um, you know, I mean, whatever, you know, we lose stuff all the time, but um, when you already don't have very much and all that you had was, you know, maybe a bed that you look, that you thought was yours and then you don't have that and you have a hefty bag and they're locking you out and changing the locks on the door in front of you and you have nowhere to go. Um, I think that I, I couldn't have gone on another day to, and figured out that without without unpacking that trauma to myself. And then the pivotal thing that occurred, which actually you could argue is another inspiration, I call them the tres milagros, but what, you know, how do we get out of that? I mean, our scenario lasted until I was an adult and I didn't believe, and I was an indigenous daughter, so I didn't believe in the away nation. I took care of my mom until she crossed over. Um, we were together through through thick and thin, through everything. Um, but uh, yeah, but it didn't stop until I was, you know, in my twenties, and a whole lot of things occurred. But really, what occurred is a revolutionary lawyer busted me out of jail because I was eventually incarcerated. That's, I, I I'm not joking when I say incarcerated for crimes mm -hmm. of poverty. Um, I did three months hard time in uh, Santa Rita for the act of being houseless, which is you know. Every, every reason for the plantation prison is pretty much uh, raced and classed um, and, and, and ridiculous and horrible and part of the plantation system we live in. But nice. that said, the revolutionary lawyer who busted me out uh, converted my thousands of hours of remaining fines because they were going to keep me longer into community service and the community service. He said, what can you do? And I tentatively said, um, I can write. I really quietly said it though, because I didn't think of myself as a writer. I thought of myself as a hustler, a survivor, a street scholar, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and he said, then that's what you'll do. Mm. It changed my life. Most definitely. So from then on, and I also shout out to Tony Morrison and Yes. Maya Angelou and the bluest eye and oh my god these things these books saved my life so let's not forget them those beautiful yes thank you oh you know we, we got a message on chat from Letty and Eva they say inspiration is an act of self-love and connection mm. there it is right there Ashe. yes so we're going to move on to our next question um, what is your most powerful poem and why <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard one that's like that what you song rapper i don't know you know after listening to the three of you you would think there'd be a hundred hundred of them <laughs> well maybe that's why there's too many <laughs> but what is your 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 you think you think it's the most part your most powerful poem i guess oh you're talking to me 
Yes, uh, anyone, Nisha? Oh. Charita, that's okay. I, I, I'm not sure how the roundabout is, is, is going. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll but, call um, you. yeah, Let's help out there. Yeah, because it looked like uh, Tiny was about to say something. Oh, no, go for it, honey. I'm still pondering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck. Okay. Still pondering. Uh, yeah, because I, when a poem calls you to, to write it, Mm. and and come for it mm. you don't think that it's less or more than others it's what you have to do oh yeah oh i um yeah and and you know the i guess some of the the inspiration when i'm hearing because it's I, I see the questions and for me being dyslexic, I see things in patterns. So things sometimes are too compartmentalized mm -hmm. for me uh, to see it separated. So the the inspiration as well, when you mentioned Toni Morrison, I have her sitting next to me because of the, the uh, interior that she uh -huh. speaks of. Right. That brings forth what, Ooh. what, uh, needs uh, to be said and a powerful poem uh you know always speaks to, to some part of your interior mm. that you need to release to the public just like you know coming here tonight uh what poem are you going to read well what mm -hmm. what am i supposed what is said not what's the best not what will sound but what is what needs to be heard what needs to be so it is hard for me to decide what which one sure sure no i, uh, I understand that uh i want to follow yes you know, please. um yeah that's i think i even mentioned that or you know um similar to that when i read my first piece um i write from need, from mm -hmm. need. Um, and even when I, when I, when I share, when I'm on program, I can sit up the day before, two days before and figure, oh, I, I'm going to read this. I'm going to write this. I'm going to edit that. I'm going to do this. And no, once it's time, I survey and then I give what's needed. You know, it's what the spirit gives me. Like this is what's mm -hmm. needed. So mm -hmm. um, I have poems that are very uplifting and celebratory and poems that will make you laugh and, you know, roll your neck and be like, you go girl. And mm -hmm. it's all about what's needed. And what I find myself sharing more than not is the poems of power to empower community, to bring awareness to community, um, to provoke us to be active, to, to protect our children. To, to to value family, to honor self, um, to look inside. You know, we we all have fragments, you know, pieces of self that definitely needs mending. And so, sit up and I'm oh, I want to give them this. Want to give them a good time. <laughs> that's that's not what we need right now. Sure, we can sure. turn on a song and sing and clap to that, but it's what you you know, it's it's the need. It's what the folks need. So, no, yeah, I yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, you know, that's such a learning lesson for us on the outside, right? Yeah. We hear these words, you know, and, and, and then begin to understand that it's not like Jarita was saying, it's not little boxes that things are placed in, right? Right. <laughs> right. right. So that, that's I, very enlightening. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, thank you. I, I would just, um, I think that it's for me, um, very similar to, to y'all. I just, um, I think it's where I'm going to go. And, um, one of my, one of my elders told me once, you know, you have an angry ancestor in you that is constantly, oh, yes. right. That is constantly determined yes. to be heard. So just, you know, keep, keep it moving and go where you need to be going. Right. And yes. yeah. And, and so it's really what, I think she, it's, I think it's a, it's a woman bodied 
uh, sister. And I, it, and I think it's what she wants and what needs to be dropped at that place. Mm -hmm. And I am in a lot of places that uh, people don't expect me to be there. Mm -hmm. And so let's just say I'm tearing it up every time I can oh, and, I, <laughs> and telling some truth that yes. needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And really that's, you know, I, I feel very, um, I also ride with ancestors pretty intensely. And so I know they're talking to me and it's in my tradition to honor them. And, and then also lastly, um, I teach through poetry, right? So I think mm -hmm. as, you know, we, we, we launched this uh, theory we call poverty scholarship, which is, uh, you know, the theory of poor people's survival, really. Um, and I believe that as poverty scholars, we, we don't teach through um, conventional tools. We teach through words and song and prayer and poetry. Um, and so, yeah, it's that too, right? It's that too. And I have the blessing of, of being with young people as well as, as elders too. So could I figure out a forever one? I don't know, family, but I will say that I think the one I did when I was houseless again, now with my infant son, that one is probably my favorite if I had to really choose. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you for that. You know, we have the next two questions, and I'm going to kind of put them together because they kind of seem to, like, you know, they, they all connect. Like you were mentioning earlier, they all connect. Yeah. So, you know, the question was, you know, what do you hope happens when people hear your poetry, right? And, and, and how do you feel that can create a movement, if so, right? So how, how do you feel uh, or, or what do you hope uh, happens when people hear you? And then how, how do you think it's going to um, affect them? You know, it, 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 can, can it create a movement, you know? And if, and if so, how? Yeah, you know, poetry has always created a movement. Mm -hmm. um, though when I started writing poetry, I didn't know about poets. You know, it was writing for me was something that I began because I needed to release and there was no one or, you know, so I, I that's the way I would do it. But as I became more learned in who were the poets uh, and what was being said, especially around the time of the Black Panthers and uh, what was taking place um, uh, then. People are moved by words, Black power, Black power, certain things being repeated, said over and over, uh, the repetition. Mm -hmm. um, there's something to be said about inculcation, what we we, what we say and uh, so it's it's uh this you listen to what the spirit asks of you and it it comes through you and i i've heard many writers i've heard i mean you know especially tony and and just uh, Zorno hurston and um you know writers that would talk about the spirit um speaking uh sonia sanchez um something makes you want to go in and say something that you feel well if it's even if it's not a huge thing though sometimes i have stood in crowds and i see people from the don't say that don't make them riot. You know, it's like, don't, don't cause a riot. You have to know when to form things where you're not, because, because uh, the rioting is, is another thing. But um, as I said, uh, you, you say something that makes a movement where people can begin to heal and find a way to uh, make a change. That's, that's, uh, it's going to be evident for our children's children because uh, children are wondering about things now. We're under spells. We are mm. under some deep spells. Right? Mm. And these spells, oh my God. Mm. Yes. That's, that's a whole 
that's a whole workshop <laughs> that I would need to do. Um, Definitely, because yeah. it's it's been you know cataloging. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, but yeah. It's, yeah, it's narratives that it's creating. Yeah, mm -hmm. the narratives, the yeah. stories, yes. you know, the the poetry. You know, it's always made changes throughout the world. Mm -hmm. There are people in other parts of the world that value who we are as poets, storytellers, writers, then they, they value them more than here, though there is a change taking place. And uh, so it is, it is taking place. Thank you. Nisha, your thoughts? Um, we are the sirens. We make the noise. Mm -hmm. We push the subjects. We, we push, we push, we push, we fight. Um, I feel like we are the voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I want people to receive from my poetry, mm -hmm. and this is something that, you know, I don't really think a whole lot about, but because I was asked the question, I want people to know that I'm a movement, but not just me. We're mm -hmm. all a movement. Mm -hmm. We we have the power, we possess what we need to make change. But society teaches us this one thing. And so most of society goes towards that one thing. And you have the radicals, the rebels, those who dare to say what a lot of us need to hear, have the audacity to say what a lot of us are thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a big risk, but we do it because it's a calling. It's really a calling. It's an anointing. It's a gift and a curse because a lot of it does come from trauma, right? It, it, yes. It's bred in trauma, you know, but we use that as the fire, you know, that has molded us and made us these badass radicals. Um, Absolutely. And so we proceed because yeah. that's our job. That's our job. So I just want people to know that we all possess the power to make change. We are a movement individually, but when we come together collectively, that's a fort. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's an impenetrable fort when we come together. Can I just go back really quick? Because I was thinking another inspiration really briefly, or mm. another inspiration, please. a huge inspiration in fact. Yes, mm. please. Is Janice Mary Katani. Mm. Ooh. Wow, yes. Because um, I, my family, we experienced homelessness. Me, my mom, when she grabbed her babies and had to flee from the abuser, we were all over the place. But again, she was a praying woman and she loved to do for community. Mm -hmm. And she taught us that. So we would go and help serve our our folks at Lai. And I got a chance to learn about Janet's story before even learning about Maya's story. And so when I learned that those two were best friends, well, she's talking about fire. So yes, yeah, that's I, yes. I don't want to ever overlook that ancestor. Yes. And I had the honor of standing in the pool pit and just you know, this year, where they both stood. Yes. So. Yes. Thank you. We miss her. We definitely miss her. Yes. And, she's just, and we still hear her. You know, yes. she's still with us. We still hear her words. Eli, yeah. yeah. So that's a great message. Uh, she thank was you a so woman much. of a lot of heart. Yes. A lot of heart. Yes. Tiny, your thoughts? Um, I mean, I'm definitely on a, um, about movement building through words. Um, I kind of, you know, we say that we poor mm -hmm. people built these homes with a poem. Mm -hmm. When I mentioned homefulness before, homefulness, uh, that um i really do feel that i don't have any time to waste um we're in, we're in so much crisis uh capitalism was always going to go this way it was not a question and the violence of hoarding and land stealing and all of these things that just are taken as a norm um need to be unpacked and unearthed and mama earth needs to take back and our first nations ancestors and our black ancestors and all of our folks need to um lift up and liberate and so to me words are absolutely a movement um and i really 
also work to uninvisibilize you know, so why do I walk around in my in my soiled jail suit? Of course, I didn't actually get it from jail. They don't give you a care package to go, mm -hmm. but I acquired it. Uh, it's my, you know, it's my um, Northern Turtle Island version of uh, Subcomandante Marcos and uh, as the poverty scholar. That's my my persona, and this is my MMIW. That's missing, murdered Indigenous women. Um, mm. And so I'm uninvisibilizing all of the peoples that people never see. Um, and I oftentimes say that you know, I'm no different than any poverty scholar that you may or may not see. It's just that I'm going to talk right up in your face about the things that they're not able to because you've essentially silenced them. Yeah. Um, this is a very real situation and it gets worse. Um, and so, yeah. To me, words are probably one of the most powerful ways to build movement. Um, it's also, you know, some of the best movement workers. Um, and I just want to lift up Uncle Al Robles, also another poverty scholar and mm -hmm. of the Manila Town I Hotel, um, you know, who also used poetry to take back um, a building that was stolen from 210 mm -hmm. disabled uh poor uh el elders basically of color um in manila town aka you know of the filipino district of frisco mm -hmm. and um and like we say us poor people built these homes with a poem where actually we have i have a word called mama festo but we actually are literally rewrite our stories and that's how we teach folks with race and class privilege about radical redistribution you know how could we poor people ain't got two nickels to put together how could we be doing this right um so yes words have power words are magic mm -hmm. and not only that but words are movement mm -hmm. and so thank you for that beautiful question yeah yes yes you know uh, i've learned so much just in the little time i've been with the three of you um and what recommendations would you give to people that want to do poetry but really don't know how to how to get started? Well, I th I think from what you've heard of us, we uh, kind of already said that in in some ways mm -hmm. that you sp speak from what you know best that may have upset something and then you found a way to make it better or you you saw a way that it healed or you know or you want to make someone aware of an issue that needs to be addressed that has not been uh you know as sister nisha said you know you want to be that siren you know and always uh I feel like I feel like I've always uh, kind of been that kind of person in in some ways because there's they said oh you that's 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 what you did that's well I've never heard anything like that you know but then you get around so many other people and you find the same thing we have different ways of addressing things that have taken place in our in our world and uh yeah everything from uh yeah get, getting through uh six years of foster care and mm -hmm. you know uh you know yeah i'm no i'm not gonna kill myself because uh i was presented a vision mm -hmm. <laughs> and his vision said you know you have a roof over your head and food in your mouth. <laughs> uh, you see this vision? These people are outside, bone thin, cold, exposed, have no place to go, but you have food and a roof. Hold on. Mm. And so I've shared this, this story with many children. And, you know, and uh, because 40% of the population in Oakland is, uh, you know, the children are, it, supposedly are in foster care yeah. or in some kind of health facility, um, health care uh, facility. Um, and so, yeah, come from what you know, oh, what you know best. Right. 
you know, uh, yeah, and, and yes. you can't you can't judge. Oh, well, they're talking about that. Maybe I should No, you. You go where you come from. There you go. You go what you know best. Yeah. And then that way, each of us can have our own expertise in what we do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Nisha, what do you think? Just right. Mm -hmm. Just right. Release. Get it out. Because if you're holding on to something, it's gonna come up. spirit is telling you to let it go. Put it out there. Someone needs that. That's sustenance. That's yes. healing. That's personal healing, but that's communal healing. And that's also sustenance. Be fearless. Just right. Okay. Just right. You know, it's medicine. It's medicine. And that's your ministry. Mm -hmm. You can be skilled and craft at a thousand things, but that's yours. That's yours. So just write. You never know what will happen, what type of effect your story, your poetry, your words, your life, your testimony, your story will have on the next person. So be fearless and just write. Don't worry about anything when it comes to poetry because it is a rhythm. You create what you want. It's a rhythm. Right? And it's going to teach you. Yeah. It's going to teach you. And it's yeah. going to carry you. It's going to take you. Okay. And do it Do it with the right intention. Woo! Don't write anything thinking, this is going to give me a name. This is going right. to give me income. You do it with the intention. <laughs> well, I'm going to remember this in my next poetry class. <laughs> I'm going to remember this in my next poetry class. That's Definitely. Good. Thank you for that. And yeah. You time. know what you know from what you know. <laughs> I like that. Tiny? I mean, well, just that, uh, I don't know. So I, we do people's school for poverty scholars and people's school for folks with race and class privilege. And so an invitation to, um, we, we run, you know, free classes and out here in Oakland, deep East Oakland, but also in one in Frisco as well. So that anyone wants to know, we help people write their own books and, um, you know, folks in struggle, um, because it's, it's how we survived. And it's also how we build movement as we've been talking about tonight. Um, but one of the things I teach is I say, you got to get out of the procrastination because let's be real. It's a location. Okay. And <laughs> I love what Nisi has said. Just right family, just right. Because truthfully, um, a lot of us folks who think and, and actually are called to writing, we overthink. And then we, you know, we cut ourselves off before we even got out the pass. No, 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 no. So please don't overthink for anybody who's watching this and has, has stuck yes. in that procrastination. Um, get that pen and paper, get that phone, get that laptop or whatever it is, writing instrument that you have um, and literally just, just let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can fine tune later. There are so many, what, what, what did uh, an old white man writer once said? I mean, Hemingway, uh, the best <laughs> writing is in, <laughs> sorry guys, the best writing is in the rewriting, okay? Mm -hmm. So we can fine tune that just like sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, the word is a brush stroke and it gets to, it needs to get on paper. And I love all these beautiful folks. Thank you, Nisia and Tarita. Oh my God, and Eric for this beautiful night. There's so much medicine. Yes, Tiny, I love those curveballs you throw as you're speaking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, you have to catch them. I really like to, quick. I like to mess with the colonial language. Okay. We got to. Oh it. yes. Flip yeah, it. that's that's yeah. when people see the word Bible. Yes, <laughs> right. Yes. You, uh, you know, because uh, natives definitely were on it right. immediately. Yeah. They jumped on it. They said, wait a minute. Yeah. What, what is this saying? Right. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Born broken. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. So that, that delivery of words that you have. Mm. <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's very inspiring. And, you know, yes. and I want to ask you, where'd you learn your Spanish? <laughs> I've been hearing a lot of words coming out in Spanish from you. Oh, from me? Um, yes, I, yes, I learned, well, mama was Boricua, you oh, know, Boricua, and so okay. she held a little bit of that before the colonizers took it all away yeah. from her. And then I'm from L.A. and yeah. I, up in the day in Las Calles, not not in the school, fam. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, just learn to survive. If you don't, if you don't got that other colonizer's language in your pocket, you already know it's a little bit harder in the street. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, last question. We're almost towards the end. Um, how do you want your poetry to be remembered? How do you want your poetry to be remembered? If yeah, tiny. Um. Wow. Okay. You flip in the script here. You're going to start with me. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's funny because one, one of my, literally my BFF and probably, I don't, you know, uh, my partner in, in crime, um, Leroy Moore, that tells you, you know him. He's a badass mm -hmm. poet as well. Crip Hop Nation, um, co-founder of Homefulness and, and po Poets at Poor Magazine. But anyway, he and I always joke that, um, you know, we'll only be remembered when we pass, when we transition, you know, that uh, that's when we'll get the quote unquote fame. And <laughs> I always joke about when, you know, instead of like, I want to make a video that just like where I'm flipping the bird going, no, don't fetishize me now because I'm gone. Where were you when I was here? So I just had to give you that little anecdote. Sure. But all that to say, <laughs> I want to be remembered for... Um, for working to unsell mama earth mm -hmm. with my words she's not a commodity mm -hmm. and we were lied to a long time ago mm -hmm. family and all of us are caught all of us are caught in that capitalist lie yes that's Thank all you. that's, that's beautiful Teresa, how do you want your uh, poetry to be remembered i have not thought about that mm -hmm. I, you yeah. know that's not something you think about i mean for me it's the same thing as you know it's like you know you have to write a poem but you don't think about you know it's you have to do the poem you have to uh -huh. you have to uh you just have to do it i i don't think about that though I have been told things, I, I've experienced things, but, um, and people have told me, oh, this is going to, and, and I listen and I hear it, but it's, it's when, I, when I write, I, I don't have that in mind. That's, that's not okay. at the forefront of my mind when I write, it is about, how something needs to be healed, something needs to be addressed, something needs to be seen, something needs to be passed on to future generations so the shit doesn't happen anymore. You know, yeah. stuff that, you know we just don't, <laughs> don't need certain things repeating themselves that you know is a sign of insanity if you keep repeating it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yeah. so, yeah, that's just I understand. And Misha. I like how um like we're we're not those people <laughs> that say, Oh well I want my name to go down in my poetry to win mm -hmm, awards. Mm -hmm. Nah. <laughs> okay. Oh uh, <laughs> you know, I, I want I want it, I want it to resonate with you now. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Right, I want I want it to be heard now, hear it now, and however you take it into the world, be active. And how would I want it remembered? You ain't got to remember it when you hear it. Let it move you now. <laughs> okay. Let it provoke you now. You know, I want it to be effective now. Mm. Right. Tomorrow. Yeah. Mm. And whatever happens then happens. But now. Right? So if people say, Oh, I remember sitting in a whatever and I heard Nisha. That's great. But you can sit back and reflect on that. But in the moment, how did it hit you? What did it provoke you to do? What did you take from it? And mm -hmm. what did you give back? What did you give? Right? So I don't know if my answers are like hard, but that's really 
what I feel. Like, I, sure. I don't really care how people remember it. Mm-hmm. I want you to take it when it's present Yes. and do but something. That's, that's real. Mm-hmm. Thank mm-hmm. you. That's real. Yeah. Ladies, we're coming to the end. I don't see any questions in the chat, but there is one remark that says, this has been enlightening and freeing. And it really has been for me. It's been a great experience. I've learned quite a bit from you, from your, your stories and your experience. So we're really grateful to you for, for joining us. Um, we have a little gift that we're going to be sending you from Glide in the mail. So expect that. I think you'll yeah. enjoy it. Um, I want to thank you know our, our uh, attendees tonight. Our next uh, Justice Virtual event will be August 25th called 43, 43 Years of Cultural Resistance. 2022 mm-hmm. so we hope we see everyone um, here on august 25th and please you know join us for that event also so again thank you so much for being with us uh, it's been an honor thank you, you so much. thanks to you thank to all of you thank you thank you thank you and thank you to hannah for uh, all the technical assistance for tonight mm-hmm. yes Thank, Thank you, you, family. So beautiful. I'm going to hit both of you ladies up for teaching at Decolonize Academy. Just had to say it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's build. Let's stay together. Let's work together. I'm with you. I'm with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, family. Bye. Bye.